I want to thank you again for welcoming me here this morning. Humanism has become such an integral part of Unitarian Universalism that I have a very hard time imagining this denomination without it. Its basic roots go back to the Reformation, but that's not something we're going to cover today. What we're going to be talking about is how humanism has impacted our specific denomination since the beginning of the 20th century. As a community, the good folks of this gathering have chosen to recognize themselves as a fellowship, which is clear in the mission statement found on the website. We are a spiritual and intellectual community that embraces each child and adult in close fellowship, encouraging the open exchange of ideas, providing religious education for all, and serves the larger community. Yet, here we are together on a Sunday morning in a building procured at great struggle that is probably most easily identified as a church. And the members of Skylands are very clear that the traditional concepts of Christianity can no longer define how Skylands Unitarian Universalist Fellowship will use this space. In the 1970s, according to your website, which I am very grateful to, congregational singing became part of the tradition here. And by the 1990s, the denominational hymn book Singing our, the Living Tradition was added to the mix. One of the hymns from that book that can be heard in this room is called Spirit of Life. It speaks of the roots that hold us close, even as wings set us free. By understanding what these roots are, it will become clear how deeply humanism has informed Unitarian Universalism since the beginning of the 20th century. There are other roots along with humanism that are part of our tradition. If you look inside the hymn book on the first couple pages, you'll see where it, it says as a Unitarian Universalist Association, promote and affirm, and at the end of that, you will notice that the living tradition we share draws from many sources. If you see how all of these sources of inspiration we claim are important to us, you'll understand the complex mix of the denomination. Direct experiences of transcending mystery and wonder, other religions of the world, Jewish and Christian teachings, and the spiritual teachings of earth-centered spirituality. Taking time to understand these is important. It is more important, I think, as you begin a search like this, to understand why humanism holds such a critical part in understanding these pieces. The shortest way to understand the impact of humanism generally is to understand what was written in 1933 as the Humanist Manifesto. This was put together by a group of humanists, Unitarians, Universalists, scientists, people of all walks of life. But there was a high preponderance of Unitarian ministers in this group. And in the, in the preamble, it says the following. The time has come for widespread recognition of the radical changes in religious beliefs throughout the world. The time is past for mere revision of traditional attitudes. Science and economic change have disrupted the old beliefs. Religions the world over are under the necessity of coming to terms with new traditions created by a vastly increased base of knowledge and experience. In every field of human activity, 
the vital movement is now in the direction of a candid and explicit humanism. In order that religious humanism may be better understood, we, the undersigned, desire to make certain affirmations which we believe the facts of our contemporary life to demonstrate. Religion itself remains constant in its quest for abiding values, an inseparable feature of human life. Today, man's larger understanding of the universe, his scientific achievements, and his deeper appreciation of brotherhood have created a situation which requires a new statement of the means and purposes of religion. Such a vital, fearless, and frank religion capable of furnishing adequate social goals and personal satisfactions may appear to be, to many people, to be a complete break with the past. While this age does owe a vast debt to traditional religions, it is nonetheless obvious that any religion that can hope to be a synthesizing and dynamic force for today must be shaped for the needs of this age. To establish such a religion is a major necessity of the present. It is a responsibility which rests upon this generation. Humanism, religious humanism as it's sometimes called, calls upon us to make use of all our wits in order to be a synthesizing and dynamic force in the world. The old religious focus on eternal life was not cutting it any longer. Humanism points out that religion cannot stand separate from everyday life. Thus it says in the seventh point, religion consists of those actions, purposes, and experiences which are humanly significant Nothing human is alien to the religious. This includes labor, art, science, philosophy, love, friendship, recreation, all that is in its degree expressive of intelligently satisfying human living. The distinction between the sacred and the secular can no longer be maintained. Now it's obvious from this reading that there are some Pete, some flags that should go up for you in terms of how old it is. When they talk about humankind, they talk about man. I left it in its original form on purpose. I wanted to make sure that you heard how the words were constructed. But their point is well taken. We are called to be involved in every area of life, fully and religiously, not pretending to be holier than thou while Rome burns. The job of religious humanism is to connect us to the world, not to separate us from it. This, is this, this spirit of humanism remains alive and well here in the Skylands in New Jersey, here in this room, here in the religious education classes. It calls upon us to use all of our wits to improve the lot of humankind. It demonstrates complete and unconditional faith in the ability of man to solve his problems. This philosophy emerged, if you can put it in perspective, just before the war to end all wars began, 1917. And then it grew and developed in the, through the 20s. That area, that age of disillusionment and greed, it sought to bring a renewed sense of sanity and hope to a world that seemed to be wallowing in superficiality. Remember, the 1920s was the age of Great Gatsby, hollow books and all. Remember, this was the age of the evangelist Phoebe McPherson who promised her followers salvation if they would only follow her and Jesus. This was also the age in which the Reverend Bill Schultz, a past president of the UUA, talked about his own Unitarian father. And he said his father believed in the bodily resurrection after death. And he was Unitarian. I would have a very difficult 
difficult time relating to that part of Unitarian Universalism. When I read Reverend Schultz's book, which is a um, history of how the Humanist Manifesto was, was created, I had to reread it just to make sure that I read it correctly. Reverend Schultz, it should be noted, broke with his father's Unitarian beliefs during his years at Meadville Theological School and became the youngest signer of the Second Humanist Manifesto in the early 1970s. He did not remain Unitarian or Humanist throughout his ministry, but has a deep respect for its contributions to Unitarian Universalism. Humanism calls, humanism's call to integrate science and religion are heard and acted upon in many of our churches. In the 1950s, it was becoming obvious that science was not sufficiently included in our public school curricula. And in many churches throughout the country, Unitarian churches, one could be find science being taught on Sunday mornings. Plain old chemistry, physics. When I began my tenure as a religious education director at the Unitarian Church in Summit, I decided I needed to take inventory to figure out what we had and what we needed. Sounds simple enough. As I dug through the seemingly endless closets in the old house that served as the RE building with my chairperson who taught me absolutely everything I would ever need to know about how to clean a closet. <laughs> We came across, it must have been, a dozen boxes with various size balls and sticks. Like Tinker Toys. The boxes included detailed instructions of how to create molecular models of various things. Now given where the boxes were in the closet, and the density of dust on the top of each one, it was fairly clear that these kits had not been seen for many, many years. You see, I started as religious education director in 1984. When these kits were new in the 1950s, the church had determined that their church would understand the connection between science and religion. This Unitarian church was led at the time by the Reverend Jacob Trapp, who understood the connection, connection between science and religion and set about to express the awe and wonder that he had experienced. He made it possible for the children to do the same. Wonder, did any of these same kids show up in a box that moved from the VFW hall where this fellowship had its first, first roots? Wonder. Humanism made a very strong statement about the ways in which a prophet made it motivated society often excluded more people than it included. In point 15, the manifesto says, humanists are firmly convinced that ex existing acquisitive and profit motivated society has shown itself to be inadequate and that a radical change in methods, controls, and motives must be instituted. A socialized and cooperative economic order must be established to the end that the equitable distribution of the means of life be possible. The goal of humanism is a free and universal society in which people voluntarily and intelligently cooperate for the common good. Humanism demands a shared life in a shared world. This was a bold statement reflecting the disastrous state of the nation after the events of the stock market crash of 1929. I only wish that they had managed to hold on to it over the years. As the communist scares came along after World War II, this statement got played down and pushed aside because of fears of retribution. Our nation had been through many times challenging times, some of which were not so open to the free and open exchange of ideas. Even so, this statement began to seed the ground for changes that would come in the 1950s and the 1960s to dismantle the legal system of inequality that had existed since the founding of our nation. It would take the work of many people from many all religious persuasions 
to create the level of change that has occurred. I was interested to learn that among the earliest members of this fellowship were people who had been part of the historic march in Selma. It is by no means perfect now, but there have been steps forward. My hope is that we not believe that the fight for civil rights and economic opportunity for all people is over. Humanism makes bold statements about the need to change existing religious beliefs, rituals, practices in order to allow them to function effectively in the modern world. Much of the opus of the Reverend Kenneth Patton, author of the lyrics of our middle hymn, are seen as a set of, I'm sorry, I see as an effort to create a new set of rituals and practices that will bring a deeper sense of the religious to these bold humanist statements. There are also ideas that were created when it was possible to believe in the ultimate goodness of science and the scientific process. The fifth affirmation states, the nature of the universe depicted by modern science makes unacceptable any supernatural or cosmic guarantees of human values. Obviously, humanism does not deny the possibility of realities yet undiscovered, but it does insist that the way to determine the existence and value of any and all realities is by the means of intelligent inquiry and by the assessment of their relation to human needs. Religion must formulate its hopes and plans in the light of the scientific spirit and method. This says to me that the scientific spirit and method as is the only bedrock upon which religion can be founded. Wow. One might need to ask whether or not the scientific spirit and method always works for the betterment of all the people and species of the world. Has this humanist manifesto made too many assumptions about the goodness of science and those using the scientific method? Is it possible that science could be used to create evil as well as good? Well, if you can't smell a rhetorical question here, maybe I've just lulled you to sleep. The events coming close on the heels of this manifesto would demonstrate that the world may have been engaged in a war to end all wars, but it had by no means wiped out evil. Hitler was just getting himself set up to commit some of the worst atrocities of the 20th century, including well-conducted and documented scientific experiments of immense cruelty upon prisoners of the concentration camps. The scientific method was to, a way to learn the how and why of the world around us, but not to make moral choices. Just because we can genetically engineer a cat that glows in the dark. Should we? I'm not so sure. From an address at a symposium of science, philosophy, and religion in 1941, Albert Einstein said, Now, even though the realms of science and religion in themselves are clearly marked off from each other, Nevertheless, there exist between them the two strong reciprocal relationships and dependencies. Though religion may be that which determines the goal, it has nevertheless learned from science in the broadest sense what it means, what means will contribute to the attainment of the goal it's set up. But science can only be created by those who are thoroughly imbued with the aspiration toward truth and understanding. The source of religion, of feeling, however, springs from the sphere of religion. To this, there also belongs the faith in the possibility that the regulations valid for the world of existence are rational, that is incomprehensible to reason. I cannot conceive of a genuine scientist without a profound faith. The situation may be expressed by an image. 
Science without religion is lame. Religion without science is blind. By the time of this address, Einstein must have been aware that a terrible power based upon some of his most significant scientific research would be released upon the world in less than a decade. The Great War was on and all resources, scientific or otherwise, were being commandeered by both sides to destroy each other. The allure of pure science was transformed into a monster too overwhelming to ignore. Science could and would discover marvelous things, but it would not make judgments as to the morality of their use. For Einstein, the balance of power between science and religion had shifted too far. Just because we could create one bomb that would evaporate 140,000 lives in one deployment, was it morally right? Eliminating all religion became a frightening possibility. Now, if the Hegelian understanding of thesis, antithesis, and synthesis is correct, can we create a new synthesis that would allow the world to survive? This has been the challenge put to us as Unitarian Universalists, to find a way for science and religion to work together to create a true fellowship. And perhaps, just perhaps, we are the only religious group that is so synchronistic, so willing to look at things from other perspectives, that we can find a way through the maze. Since we do not claim, claim to be a creedal tradition, but a covenantal one, in other words, we are more concerned about our relationships with one another than a fixed set of beliefs. We are able to use all of our wits and the wits of all of those around us, regardless of what tradition they claim them. In many other religions, syncretism is definitely a dirty word. Our willingness to draw from many traditions has led us to the end of the 20th century to re-examine the spiritual and religious traditions from many world religions. This surge in discussions about spirituality has not always been well accepted by many humanists among us. I see many of them shaking their heads and wondering if this Unitarian Universalism isn't headed back to that old time religion that they had worked so hard to get rid of. Yet thought about spirituality continues to emerge. I think our humanists can breathe and easy and realize that this is just the next synthesis to emerge. Thesis, the old time religion, Antithesis, science. Synthesis, humanism. One of our sources of inspiration is the Eastern traditions of India and China. From that source, meditation has been found to be a useful tool. So maybe it could look like this. Thesis, humanism. Antithesis, spirituality from world religions. Synthesis, more willingness to engage in meditation. The focus on Buddhist vipassana or the mindfulness tradition has emerged in the 21st century, offering Unitarian Universalists a particular advantage because it encourages us to use all of our wits to be present in the moment without needing to refer to any divine being. It encourages us to still our constantly chattering monkey mind so that we can be present and awake for the direct experience of mystery and wonder. It can be a tool to, for, to further humanist ideals at their best while keeping us alert to the dangers of the wings of science cut loose from the morality of growing, morality growing from religious roots. It opens up a path to finding what can come next. What can be the next cycle? Just as Buddhism originally grew in India at a time 
when the priests had a chokehold on Hinduism, more worried about their wealth and power than the suffering of the people they were supposed to serve. <clears throat> Buddhism is taking root in the United States and in Unitarian Universalism at a time when there is a need to create a new synthesis between the religion that rejects the power of science to create beneficial change and the science that knows no way to define moral limits in a just world. Since we are a synchronistic tradition, willing and able to borrow religious practices from other traditions, we are able to see the value of one aspect of Buddhism and reframe it into our own traditions without taking on the whole set of beliefs. Meditation, when you think about it, only asks us to do the most important thing, according to Reverend Fulton. Look. As we look, we need to remember that the only thing in life that seems to be constant is change. So we would be wise to seek the good things in all things and look for what comes next. Revelation is a continuous process. And as we move toward the beginning of the new year, I hope that we will indeed be able to look clearly and make a place for all who wish to find a place at our table. Whether they be humanist or spiritually inspired, and however they arrived, on little feet, rolling in, walking in, that they may find a place here at this Skylands Unitarian Universalist Fellowship. Thank you. Um, if anyone has a comment, I would be happy to hear it at this time. I know it was a lot. What I would recommend is if you're interested in learning more about this Humanist Manifesto, it's available online through the American Humanist Society. And if you just put Humanist Manifesto 1933 into the search box, it'll come up really fast. Um, there's also a book that Bill Schultz has written, and it's available from the UUA and probably Amazon. I was going to ask you, Mom, Hegel's idea of the three stages, is that a big part of uh, uh, humanism? Of humanism? Yes. I don't think so. Okay. Um, what I what I was looking for was a way to figure out how these pieces fit together because they seem so diametrical. Oh, you're illustrating with that. At times, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Comments? I, I thought it was kind of neat to uh, find out that one of the signers of the Humanist Manifesto was Walter Mondale's bigger, bigger brother. Really? Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, he was oh, a Unitarian minister. Wow. Well, they're hiding everywhere, Tony. I don't know. You better watch out. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's neat. I didn't know that. I didn't realize Could that. Could you repeat that, Tony? Oh, I was uh, saying that the Humanist Manifesto, Walter Mondale's elder brother was one of the signers. The second one? Oh. The second one? No, no, no. The original 33. The, no, the 33. The 33. Oh, okay. the 33. Yeah, that's that's a way back. Yeah, no. Yeah. His brother passed away around 1990. Yeah. That was the original. Wow. Yeah, some neat people signed that document. It was, it's fun to go look at. They have a list on the website. They have a list of people who actually signed each of the three manifestos that have been written. So it's it's fun to check it out and see what happens. You know, we kind of talk about what's our elevator response to what's a Unitarian Universalist or you know, what's your, your faith or religion. And you said something that you know, actually, you know, makes so much sense. I think mean, I understand it and I, and I probably use the words in some aspect. But when you said we are less of a, we are a community less of a cradle, a cradle community, but a covenant community right. right. because we our concern is more for each other and people and relationships and the betterment right. of people than a set of beliefs. That was just so perfectly said right. and I appreciate Thank that. You. Thank you. Yeah.
it, it, it changes a lot of things and 